back on Dharma podcast with the erudite Sandeep Balakrishna. Uh, we've been talking to him on his areas of interest where he's got deep uh, knowledge uh, and has devoted his life to studying three aspects primarily, culture, history and civilization. And we are now back to resuming that series that we started with Sandeep uh, a couple of episodes back. So uh, the attempt and the endeavor here with Sandeep's knowledge is to bring out the true history of Congress party right from its inception days, what led to its inception. And we stopped at a stage where uh, the moderates and the hardliners, so to speak, had split. And the stage was set for the arrival of uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. So let's take that conversation forward with Sandeep Balakrishna. Hi Sandeep. Hi Parag. Uh, it's good to be talking to you again. So thank you for your time. Uh, Sandeep, like I said, uh, we'll resume the series uh, that we started with you on the history of Congress party. And uh, while I briefly alluded to where we stopped, uh, I think it would help the audience if you could give a slightly more uh, elaborate recap and then we could take the conversation forward from there. Oh yeah, fine. So recap is uh, a good way to start uh, <clears throat> this episode. Like uh, I mentioned in the uh, introductory episode of this uh, series uh, covering the comprehensive, near comprehensive history of the Congress party, <clears throat> it was uh, founded as a safety valve by an Englishman named uh, Alan Octavian Hume, who was also in the employ of the British government, uh, a civil servant. And uh, this, he devised the Congress, not he alone, uh, with his masters. He devised uh, the idea of founding <clears throat> an organization, pan-Indian organization like the Indian National Congress, in order to prevent a massive national rebellion, a revolution, a war for independence like uh, that the British had experienced in 1857. <clears throat> so this, this organization, this new organization, Indian National Congress, was designed to act as this safety wall which would absorb and perhaps maybe even channelize, uh, <clears throat> you know, the reaction, the outrage uh, from the Indian masses at the kind of atrocities uh, that the British colonial power was doing. So that formed the first stage and then, you know, after a couple of years, Congress was founded in 1885, a couple of years later, <coughs> Surendranath Banerjee, uh, Banerjee took over, <coughs> which is when it actually became truly national, in the sense of nationalist. And then that was followed by... Uh, uh, you know, that uh, fledgling Congress inhabited by people like Surendranath Banerjee, da Dada Bhai Navroji, Feroz Shah Mehta, all these people, that Congress, uh, by de facto, it was kind of known as the moderates. And then slowly this new organization began attracting all kinds of patriots and freedom fighters from across India. <coughs> and eventually, obviously, in a country so diverse and uh, such a large country. Remember, Pakistan was part of uh, India back then, British India, right? So, from uh, Lahore, Karachi, Rawalpindi, everywhere. So, people from uh, all persuasions, all walks of life also uh, joined. They were attracted and they joined the Indian National Congress. Obviously, a lot of differences of opinion on various uh, uh, aspects. Maybe it's functioning, it's ideals, the resolutions, it... Uh, adopted the plan of action, agitation, obviously a lot of friction, disagreements uh, kept happening and uh, uh, this reached a very serious turning point, uh, especially during the Surat session of 1907, which is when there was a open confrontation between the so-called moderates and the so-called uh, ex extremists and that Surat session uh, witnessed, uh, uh, you know, violence and disorder in the session itself physically so which is uh, also when the congress formally split for the first time as moderates and so called e extremists so the latter group was led by uh, you know revolutionaries patriots in the true sense men of action bal gangadhar tilak the famous uh, trio lal bal pal orbindo ghosh all these people so they had emerged as a formidable force uh, which in many ways actually eclipsed the so-called moderates. So the moderates uh, actually believed that 
the british rule was uh, a force for the good of india so they adopted a more uh, uh, what you call conservative step by step approach using uh, methods of persuasion and diplomacy uh, instead of uh, you know street level agitation which uh, uh, included but was not limited to violence and you know this kind of thing uh, as propounded by the so called extremists who had the upper hand all the way uh, till at least 1919 or uh, the cut off point is uh, uh, roughly till the death of uh, lokmanya bal gangadhar tilak so this is where you know this 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 is a brief recap of uh, the all the uh, previous episodes to continue from the previous episode where we had stopped at the split of the original indian national congress between like i said uh, moderates and uh, ex- uh, so called extremists which occurred in 1907 or 1908 so uh, there'll be a lot of overlaps and repetitions because that's the nature of the beast of the subject so both these groups went their separate uh, ways in a manner of speaking so let's also in this episode let's survey uh, you know the scenario back then 1908 maharashtra what is today known as maharashtra which included by the way parts of karnataka the bombay presidency okay so which included parts of karnataka uh, bombay of course uh, the whole of maharashtra even gujarat ahmedabad by the way was part of the bombay presidency so that was one then uh, the other big region was bengal obviously which included uh, bangladesh what is today known as bangladesh large parts of odisha as well and interestingly one part of odisha was uh, included in the madras presidency one part of odisha one part of odisha so that that is the other region bengal which is where the <clears throat> you know actual uh, british conquest of india happened battle of plassey palashi and the other big place was punjab so these three huge regions ruled by directly ruled by the british they witnessed extraordinary revolutionary activity once again led by you know stalwarts like lal bal pal uh, and uh, uh, on the other side you had the moderates uh, doing their persuasive constitutional methods as all these things were occurring simultaneously especially in these in these regions <clears throat> where the revolutionaries or the so called ex- extremists <clears throat> had the upper hand the british naturally became more and more belligerent and especially under a complete ruthless heartless man he was a viceroy of india minto so this guy he wrote a letter uh, uh, to john morley remember morley minto yes. forms so reforms so this john morley was a secretary of uh, state for india <clears throat> that is he was a subordinate of minto so minto writes a letter uh, uh, to this guy morley and uh, this is what he says and i quote when you say that if reforms do not save the raj nothing else will i am afraid i must utterly disagree the raj will not disappear in india as long as the british race remains what it is because we shall fight for the raj as hard as we have ever fought if it comes to fighting and we shall win as we have always won close quote you know this is a 0.0000000000001% of the sort of arrogance you know the uh, uh, haughtiness that colonial british uh, rulers had in fact we can do a separate series on that but this is what uh, uh, minto wrote to morley and uh, minto was succeeded by a guy called hardinge he was the viceroy who was serving in india during world war 1 these are all important historical context if you have to understand transport yourself back to that time so there is great clarity on uh, you know the history of the congress party so minto incidentally was the first admirer was the first british admirer of a man named mohandas karamchand gandhi 
Minto was Minto was okay, and uh, he was also the first notable British viceroy to admire Mohandas Gandhi openly. Which brings us to the origin of the next stage in the history of the Congress Party. This stage is the unlikely emergence of Mohandas Gandhi, who eventually went on to monopolize both the Congress Party and the freedom struggle itself. which is also the real starting point of today's episode let's set the proper context both national that is indian and global so unless we have like i said you know unless we set this kind of context we will not arrive at a truthful and objective analysis of the life career uh, and the legacy of uh, mohandas gandhi so the year 1919 it marks the real turning point in gandhi's shot at limelight political and national limelight why is it so important because of three things three significant things that happened that year the first was something called the raulat bill which later became the raulat act and its consequence the consequence of the raulat uh, act was a unhinged untrammeled reign of terror throughout punjab especially punjab which culminated in the brutal savage climax in jallianwala bag massacre of 3000 more than 3000 some est uh, estimates uh, put the figure at uh, around 12 or 15000 innocent indians gathered there peacefully who were you know basically genocided by general dyer and <clears throat> that was a climax jallianwala bag was a climax but the lead up to the jallianwala bag was the extremely barbaric enforcement of martial law in punjab this was a direct result of the raul attack it had pretty much given them a uh, given the british a blanket license to do whatever they want number 2 raulat act was number 1 first uh, major uh, episode the second was the emergence of mohandas karamchand gandhi who had acquired some fame due to his success in something called satyagraha in south africa so that success put uh, you know put gandhi in uh, in the public uh, 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 consciousness of india back in india and number 3 is perhaps the most important occurrence that happened in 1919 this was the revival of pan islamism as a force in indian politics oh that i this... consciously use the word indian politics and not indian freedom struggle so the emergence of this also was in 1919 this was in 1919 okay, okay? and uh, in rc majumdar's uh, words uh, and i quote him <clears throat> the raulat act brought into limelight a political leader who was destined to achieve worldwide fame and distinction such as has seldom been the lot of any non official political leader in any country this was mohandas karamchand gandhi so 1919 is a proper context these three things have occurred very important with that let's rewind let's rewind and look at some important some major stages in mohandas karamchand gandhi's career the first is his early life birth early life and uh, uh, then uh, his uh, migration to south africa and then his return to india from south africa and then his entry into political activism after the raulat act and then his role in something called the khilafat movement and this was followed by his complete usurpation of the congress organization remember it was not a party it was a movement freedom of movement organization and then his various uh, 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 episodes of non cooperation most notably uh, his success in champaran then dandi march 
and his serial imprisonments and then his elaborate and uh, prolonged role as the supreme dictator of the Congress party, his, uh, uh, you know, rather uh, equally elaborate, equally prolonged uh, uh, appeasement of Muslims and his final years followed by his death. We will keep this as a broad framework to analyze this stage of the Congress party's history. The, uh, what is known variously as the era of Gandhi. As we all know, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born on uh, October 2nd, 1869 in a fairly uh, well-to-do family in Porbandar, uh, Gujarat. Then uh, he finished his education uh, in law and then migrated to England in 1888 and qualified himself at the bar in London. And in 1891, he began, he returned to India, began to practice in courts, but was a thorough failure as a lawyer, both in Rajkot and in Bombay. One incident occurred uh, during his initial uh, legal practice, uh, this happened in Bombay, where he was uh, insulted, very badly insulted uh, uh, by an English political agent of the Kathiawar state. So, like I uh, mentioned in a previous episode, uh, the imperial colonial British government used to employ political agents uh, stationed in the courts of princely states. So, one of uh, one uh, one such uh, British political agent in the Kathiawar state, he insulted Bombay. He insulted Gandhi in Bombay on one occasion, and uh, Gandhi records this incident in his autobiography, My Experiments with Truth. Uh, an extremely dangerous book at uh, this distance in time. So, this is what uh, Gandhi says in uh, about this incident. This shock changed the course of my life. He was a very, very sensitive man, Gandhi. Uh, not, not too much of a thick skin required to for a lawyer. You know, you have to have an extremely thick skin to practice law. Anyway, so he was, he kind of withdrew into a shell and uh, he thought that, look, I am not cut out for this legal profession, at least in India. So, he decided to go abroad. <laughs> and then he got an offer from a, a trading firm which uh, belonged to a, a prosperous uh, uh, Porbandar Muslim family. So, they made him an offer, uh, ki, you know, why don't you do our, uh, take care of our legal work in South Africa for one year. So, he accepted that and then uh, he migrated to South Africa and he uh, arrived uh, in uh, Natal in May 1893. Okay. 1893, incidentally, was the same year in which the great Swami Vivekananda delivered his immortal speech in the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago. This was when the same year when Gandhi had landed in Natal. And then we all know, uh, you know, the story of uh, how he was kicked out from the uh, railway compartment by the uh, British uh, officials out there because he was, a, uh, he was an Indian, you know, inferior race, all that. So, and this is what, uh, uh, you know, uh, R.C. Majumdar notes about this incident. Uh, rather, before that, when uh, Gandhi, when a journalist uh, asked uh, Gandhi about what he felt about that incident in, uh, uh, you know, getting thrown off the train in South Africa, Gandhi said that this was one of the most creative experiences in my life. This was the most creative experience? One of the most creative experiences in my life. We don't know, I mean, he doesn't qualify what he means by creative, creative experience. Gandhi began to kind of slowly involve himself in the uh, fight against the racial discrimination that Indians faced out there and uh, we all know that story uh, but before that Gandhi comes back to India in 1896 and he writes a public pamphlet which uh, uh, basically describes the humiliations imposed upon Indians in South Africa. So that obviously enraged the white masters out there in South Africa so they look out for him when he uh, uh, comes back there next and as soon as he goes there he has 
his first uh, uh, rebellious instinct out there so a lot of people he goes there to south africa with his family a uh, lot of his well wishers they take his uh, uh, as soon as they land in south africa they carry off his wife and children to safety and they say gandhi you also come with us because you never know what the government will do so gandhi says no i'm going to defy this and then a mob surrounds him he is beaten almost uh, till death and then the wife of a police uh, superintendent she comes to his rescue admits him to the hospital and you know saves his uh, life and in spite of all this you know what gandhi does in spite of this humiliation the physical assault that you know unleashed by the government itself in spite of this gandhi forms something called an ambulance corps to help the british during the boer war and his service is recognized by the british but and you know they applaud it but they just stop at applause so gandhi thinks that you know by uh, uh, you know helping out this uh, uh, the oppressor his heart would melt and you know he would be kind to them i mean the the naivete is astounding or perhaps his this, idea of creativity so this keeps <laughs> so this is a theme that he will expand in future okay so this is the first seed of his so called uh, you know melting appealing to the good uh, conscience of the oppressor so this is the first expression of that the british being the british at the height of their racism and their colonial uh, uh, arrogance uh, uh, i mean they are like look okay fine you have helped us thank you that's all they continue their operation so still gandhi does not give up what he does is he enlists lot of people a bunch of people to assist the british once again in their brutal operation of the zulu fight for freedom okay in this happens in 1906 okay the uh, zulu uh, chapter you know the sheer heartless manner in which uh, uh, the british put down uh, the zulus uh, i mean it's it it it's cut wrenching to say the least so this man helps uh, gandhi he forms a squad of 24 uh, uh, stretchers to help whom the wounded soldiers of british so the oppressor again the oppressor again okay and uh, i mean it's 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 really crazy and this is what he says uh, way back in 1904 when he sided uh, uh, you know with the british against the zulus this is what he says the british empire existed for the welfare of the world and gandhi had genuine sense of loyalty to it stick with this point i'll expand this uh, you know in a minute and this is what he said about the zulus who were so ruthlessly suppressed by the british and i quote these are gandhi's words i bore no grudge against the zulus they had they had harmed no indians i had doubts about the rebellion itself i then believed that the british empire existed for the welfare of the world a genuine sense of loyalty prevented me from even wishing ill to the empire close quote this is gandhi a genuine sense of loyalty loyalty the most astounding fact when we survey gandhi's uh, uh, life and legacy and his activism everything he did is that why didn't anybody take gandhi at face value he never hid anything that he did he would declare his plan he would declare his uh, 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 you know views and opinions my experiments with truth his autobiography is as clear clear as daylight so take him at face value you know why don't we do it why do we keep you know making excuses inventing excuses writing apologies on his behalf for mistakes he committed anyway so gandhi bore the same loyalty towards the british empire in india back then and towards the end it might shock a lot of people when i say this and these are not my words 
lot of scholars of R.C. Majumdar and Dr. Uh, uh, Kothari, you know, scholars of that caliber. You know, they have distilled this, this legacy beautifully. So, towards the end, Gandhi's loyalty to the British Empire was unflinching. He, in fact, didn't want the British to leave India. But here's a data point. On 9th October 1908, Gandhi wrote a letter to the then governor of Madras and I quote an excerpt from it. I should be uninterested in the fact as to who rules India, the important consideration being how he ruled. Uh, do you re uh, mind repeating I this? I will definitely Rodney? repeat with pleasure. I should be uninterested in the fact as to who rules India, the important consideration being how he ruled. Uh, I don't want to stray. Uh, uh, would uh, any insights as to why this inbred loyalty towards the? I will come to okay. that slowly. So that is a recurring undercurrent, underlying theme, you know, throughout the series okay. on Gandhi. Okay, and uh, this is what he wrote to the governor of Madras, and uh, R. C. Majumdar gives a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, observation about this letter in rather blunt language and I quote Gandhi's loyalty to the British was a loyalty impervious to the wave of nationalism that was sweeping over India at that time and it would have struck dumb even the most moderate of the moderates in Indian politics it is quite dumbfounding ok close quote what this shows what all such remember this happened very, very, very early before Gandhi even came to India for his political activism. He did all this, you know, uh, staying in South, India, uh, South Africa. South Africa. Hmm? What this one episode clearly shows is exactly how clueless he was about the political situation in India on the ground. Okay. And remember the previous episode of the series where... Uh, I uh, narrated the story about the split in the original Congress between moderates and uh, so-called ex extremists. Although they split, both were agreed on one point and that was uh, about the mood of that period which once again R.C. Majumdar uh, uh, narrates beautifully, quote, at that very moment, that is when Gandhi wrote that later, 1908, that period. At that very moment, Indians of all shades of public opinion looked upon self-government as their immediate or ultimate goal. And Gandhi out here, sitting there in South Africa, clearly had no idea of these living realities. But then, he had the gumption, he had the confidence to write such letters directly to the governor of Madras. Madras okay. presidency was one of the most important British presidencies, like I said. So, completely contrary to the sentiment prevailing across the length and breadth. In India. In India. This man is sitting in South Africa writing to the governor of Madras, having zero idea about, you know, political and national uh, realities. Okay. So, this is pretty, this pretty much sums up, uh, uh, you know, Gandhi's... Uh, 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 political, uh, I don't know if you want to call it the word uh, ideology or philosophy, but his, his, his understanding of the situation of that time. Okay. And in my humble opinion, an author named Michael Edwardes, a British author, he has written a beautiful biography of uh, Nehru. So in that book, he has, he gives us one of the best character analysis of Gandhi and I quote, <clears throat> Only British ruled Hindu India could have produced such a figure as Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. This is the very first line of that chapter. Though educated in the western style at Bombay and London, he remained fundamentally an unreconstructed Indian. Unreconstructed Indian. Okay. Really? One one effect of his Western education was to supply words for his political vocabulary to be used as a Hindu peasant would use in a railway train <laughs> as a means of communication. Brilliant, like you said. Another, 
which was to have a profound effect on his strategy in the fight for freedom was a conviction that the British were a moral people believing in justice. If they could be persuaded to recognize the unrighteousness. This was the illusion, the delusion that Gandhi labored throughout his life. Unless you have this kind of solid foundation, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, unravel the life and legacy and career of uh, Mr. Gandhi. So let's get back to South Africa. <clears throat> Gandhi's first uh, Satyagraha began in South Africa. It became hugely successful, partly because in the final stages, partly due to the intervention of the same Viceroy, Hardinge. Remember? Yeah. The oppression in South Africa especially was very brutal compared to uh, India. So, m most Indians who had gone there uh, belonged to the lower classes. Some were taken as indentured labor and some was, were employed as clerks and they didn't have any rights to speak of. They were, uh, you know, their fingerprints were taken as if, you know, they were criminals. Uh, permits for everything was required for Indians, this kind of thing. So, very brutal. Uh, racist uh, thing basically. Uh, Gandhi successfully did this uh, non-violent uh, Satyagraha there and it became successful and uh, you know the Indian community out there, mill workers, mine, uh, you know laborers employed in uh, diamond mines, you know the dregs of the society. So they stood solidly behind Gandhi, endured beatings, all kinds of torture, they lost their homes, you know, they had to uh, live, literally live on the streets with infants, their wives, the whole family. Very, very, very oppressive, uh, very brutal treatment. And Gandhi won. They stood solidly behind Gandhi because he also endured these things. He did. He did. He did. He endured these things. Okay. That I think is the finest hour of his life to give due credit. So great organizer, you know, his passive uh, resistance, the Satyagraha, that became a huge success there. So, in the final stage, Hardinge was observing these things from India. He intervened on Gandhi's behalf and wrote several letters to the government in England as well as in South Africa. He said, this is not acceptable. Oh, he did? He did. He said, this is not acceptable. Not only that, he said, I am a big admirer of Gandhi. He did that, so his intervention stopped this uh, uh, operation, okay. discrimination against India, as a result of which uh, the South African government passed something called the Indian Relief Act in 1914. This was a great achievement and it made Gandhi a hero for the first time and brought him into national attention in India. This is the first major step. Okay. And uh, when Gandhi was asked about, uh, you know, this, this uh, 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 agitation in South Africa, he originally described this movement in South Africa as passive resistance, which is a fairly well-known term in the political lexicon in Europe itself back then. The word Satyagraha was deliberately substituted for this term much later. Why? Because Gandhi, after returning to India, felt ashamed to use an English term, passive resistance. That is one reason. The second reason is because he wanted to stress on the fact that there was an essential difference between his movement and something called passive resistance. So, Satyagraha was his baby. Okay. My creation. So, so, don't confuse it for with, with something called passive resistance. In, for, in fact, he's uh, gone on record saying that the difference between Satyagraha and passive resistance is a difference between North Pole and South Pole. Oh, he said that. Anyway, so, fast forward, some of the later offshoots of Satyagraha, when Gandhi, you know, became almost this unchallengeable uh, uh, leader of the freedom movement, some of the offshoots of Satyagraha included non-cooperation, non-violent non-cooperation, civil disobedience, hartal, which means a temporary strike, fasting, 
marching, fasting as a purificatory ritual and peaceful picketing. Peaceful picketing. Picketing, okay. right? So, I will read out the list again. Non-cooperation, civil disobedience, hartal, fasting, purificatory fasting, marching and peaceful picketing. Now, recall how all these very same tactics were used by Congress politicians after independence. Every single one of these tactics were invariably accompanied by violence, arson, looting and burning and destruction, vandalism of public property. This is the alleged what Gandhi called as my greatest strength and weapon. As long as Gandhi was alive, violence was not there. So, the question arises as to the innate strength of Satyagraha and all its uh, 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 progeny. After independence, you know, especially during, uh, 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 after uh, Nawab Nehru became unchallenged, uh, uh, both within the government and the Congress party, every statement by a Congress party, the politician, big and small, that, you know, uh, I am taking out a peaceful march. One or two days later, some rioting would follow. Leave a trail of violence. Right? Indira Gandhi, though, it was at the peak. Hartal, Band, all these things. Okay, the similarity is now coming out. Yeah. So, the original progenitor of these tactics was Mr. the apostle of non-violence, <laughs> Mr. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Okay, you have to... Merely scratching the surface won't help. So, on Satyagraha, passive resistance, you know, uh, things of that nature used for the first time as, uh, 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 as, as as a political tool, a political tactic, it was not terribly original. Tyagraha, that is a curious uh, uh, term, Sanskrit term, both are Satya plus Agraha, meaning Agraha means agitation, Satya is truth. Okay. So, agitation based solely on the power of truth. So, in practice, it meant once again appealing to the innate goodness that lies at the, uh, uh, in the innermost recesses of every human heart. So, don't reply uh, to oppression and violence with counter-violence. So, uh, you know, you keep appealing to the uh, uh, goodness in the enemy's heart uh, with genuine love and endure all sorts of oppression any and every sort of oppression, including but not limited to death. Including but, but not, not limited. limited to death. So, this is pretty much, uh, uh, you know, Gandhi's conception of uh, Satyagraha. His brand of Satyagraha was not terribly uh, new. And in fact, <clears throat> even while uh, during the time that Gandhi was doing his uh, uh, activism and agitation in uh, South Africa, Aurobindo Ghosh, has had written and even expounded very beautifully on uh, something called passive resistance. Okay, so that that apart. Uh, so, like I said, this is not terribly new, but Gandhi traces his uh, 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 evolution of Satyagraha to two people mainly: Leo Tolstoy and Henry David Thoreau. Okay, uh, he he never mentions Arvindo Ghosh. So, it's, it's unlikely to for us to, uh, you know, believe that Gandhi had never heard or read uh, Aurobindo Ghosh. They were contemporaries, by the way. Okay. And this man, Aurobindo Ghosh, was one of the leading uh, uh, revolutionary patriots out there in Bengal and elsewhere. So, anyway, so for all of Gandhi's claims about being influenced by uh, Leo Tolstoy and Thoreau, <coughs> the poor man apparently didn't know that a lot of Leo Tolstoy's philosophical writings were actually influenced by Hindu traditions. Oh, is that so? Yeah, okay. Hindu traditions, mainly uh, the Hindu traditions of Avadhutas and mystics, what, what the West calls as uh, 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 mystics, Yogi Pratyaksha, that's what uh, it's called, known as in Sanskrit. So, Tolstoy took a lot of those ideas uh, from here, from India. 
you should actually read uh, his beautiful short story titled Coffee House in Surat. Beautiful story. Coffee House in Surat. Uh, Coffee House in Surat. A beautiful story. So there you clearly see the Hindu influence on uh, uh, Leo Tolstoy. And as for uh, Thoreau, Thoreau himself was deeply influenced by Vedanta and Bhagavad Gita. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Thoreau and his close friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Cousin. right, a famous essayist, mm. they, both of them called themselves as transcendentalists. It was a very popular influential movement of that time. And transcendental, you know, transcendentalist uh, is a somewhat confused and uh, hodgepodge term which vaguely denotes uh, some elements of uh, Vedanta. So, anyway, sadly, these Upanishadic treasures, this beautiful philosophical wealth of Bhagavad Gita, all this was lying in Mohandas Gandhi's own backyard if only he had cared to look at them <laughs> and, you know, grasp their essence. Anyway, so all of his uh, uh, political views, his opinions uh, and his ideas about the freedom struggle, uh, the most ideal way, the best way to uh, uh, resist and, you know, fight against the British. In fact, his whole uh, political philosophy is available in his Hind Swaraj pamphlet. That is, that is where he captures the his his whole uh, 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 ideas and opinions about freedom struggle, nationalism, and you know things like that. Everybody should read it. Hind Swaraj. Pamphlet. Hind Swaraj. Everybody should read it. Okay. <coughs> and when Gopal Krishna Gokhale, he first wrote it in Gujarati, and then uh, translated into English. So, when Gopal Krishna Gokhale read its English translation in 1912, this is what he predicted and I quote, It is so crude and hastily conceived that Gandhi himself would destroy the book after spending just one year in India. Then, Gandhi being Gandhi, he was made of sterner stuff. This is what he said in 1938 about the same Hind Swaraj and I quote his own words. I might change the language here and there if I had to rewrite the booklet. But after the stormy 30 years through which I have since passed, I have seen nothing to make me alter the views expounded in it. He never repudiated it or mm. you know withdrew it. So it was shocking to read that book back then. And it is even more, infinitely more shocking to read that pamphlet today. Very eye-opening actually. So this is the point, no? All the opinions and things about Gandhi that have, you know, uh, come as received wisdom. None of, it's all second-hand, third-hand, nth-hand. Without having read his own words. Read his own words, no? He's unambiguous. I mean, Gandhi had great clarity. In, you know, his uh, methods and other things might have been mistaken. But he had absolute conviction that this was the only way. Gandhi left South Africa forever in January 1915 and then he landed in India. And when he surveyed the national and the political scene out here, he quickly became disillusioned about himself. Okay. In South Africa, he was a great hero, but out here, he was nobody. This is what he, this was the one of the first realizations that he had as soon as he landed in India. And this is how R.C. Majumdar, uh, uh, you know, captures uh, Gandhi's mindset at that time. And I quote, Gandhi himself realized that he was a misfit in politics and accepted Gokhale as his political guru. Oh, so Gandhi accepted Gopal yeah, Krishna yeah, he, he was, you know, he said, I want to be your disciple and learn from you. I mean, he was an honest man. He was, a, he might be misguided, you know, and all the other things. But fundamentally, he was a truthful and a very, very honest man. He practiced what he preached. Gokhale took him under his wings. And uh, this is what happened next. He tried to nurture Gandhi. And this is what happened next. Gokhale was deeply impressed by Gandhi's wide and liberal humanism, but 
he was not at all impressed by Gandhi's political knowledge, his political ideas and still he thought, you know, this man has potential. Remember, Gandhi was uh, more than 45 years old when he came to India from South Africa. He was born in 1869 and he returned to uh, India in 1915. So, you make the calculations. Yeah. So more than 45 years old. So, Gokhale thought that, you know, this man is immature, childish as far as political thoughts and uh, ideas are concerned. But still, I can groom him. So, what he did was that he said, okay, I will admit you to my organization called Servants of India Society. A lot of people have forgotten this. It was an extremely distinguished uh, 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 social, political and at times uh, uh, philosophical organization. The body of work that they have done is this tremendous. You know, it was patronized by the likes of uh, uh, V.S. Srinivasa Shastri. Uh, Sarim Vishveshwaraya, they all, you know, at various points they donated, they were also members, you know, Annie Besant was part of it for some time, you know, cream of the society. So, Gokhale said, okay, Gandhi, I will admit you to servants of India society. But, the other members of this society did not like the idea of admitting Gandhi because of the fundamental difference between their outlook, their methods their ideals and this airy optimism and idealism of Mohandas Gandhi. So, he was denied admission into servants of India society. He was denied. He was denied. So, you see Parag, how the real stalwarts of the Congress had kept Gandhi far, far, far away from harm's way. At most, they saw him as, you know, childish, immature. They hadn't seen him, uh, you know, seen him as a danger that he would prove to be much later. But to their credit, they saw through... They saw through <coughs> Gandhi. He was not an ordinary man, Parang. Anyway. Luminary. So, because he was denied, he had no alternative. Gandhi had no alternative because Servants of India society was, you know, pretty much the one of the, if not the most premier uh, body of its kind. Gandhi began to look for alternatives, but he didn't find all, any alternatives. As a result, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi decided to go solo and he opened up his own independent shop. Okay. This is later became famous as the ashram on the banks of the Sabarmati river in Ahmedabad. Gandhi opened that uh, shop, uh, as you call shop it. <laughs> in 1915. So, with that, we can uh, uh, conclude this episode. So, with that, we conclude the episode uh, with Sandeep Balakrishna, who with his usual deep knowledge of most subjects, he brings out the arrival of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and a brilliant character profile of what he was made of, what his thought process was and brings to four many aspects which uh, I think would be fairly illuminating to uh, all of you who have been listening to Sandeep uh, over the years. So, thank you Sandeep uh, for your uh, erudite insights into the arrival and the evolution of uh, Mondas Karamsin Gandhi. Till he decided to go solo and start, set up his own shop uh, like you said. And uh, we shall continue the conversation with Sandeep uh, and take the history of Congress party further entwined with the further rise of Mondas Karamsin Gandhi in the next episode. So thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, we invite you to like, share, subscribe, give us your super thanks so that the conversations with Sandeep reach a wider audience. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.